a special Shabbat Shalom today on the 1st of the 15th, or I'm sorry, on the 15th of the 7th month. I butchered that one. <laughs> the first day of Tabernacles as we reckon it on our Creator's calendar, which happens to line up with um, the 25th of September here, 2024, on the Gregorian calendar. And we're going to be going over a few, not exhaustive, but we're going to be going over a few of the sections of what talks about the Feast of Tabernacles through Scripture and generally what it represents, what it was first instituted as, and then the, the evidence that we're going to be keeping it all the way through into the millennial reign when he returns, which is what it's actually fully representing, right? I think a lot of people, most believers that are coming to the truth realize that the festival days are rehearsals for things that are prophetically happening. The first or the spring festivities, if you will, have already happened or been fulfilled in certain ways and acknowledged that way like with the Exodus and with the coming of our Mashiach in his first advent. And then we have the expectation of the fall festivals with his return. What we don't always catch is that there's the intermediate festivals with the Shavuot, with the new oil, new wine, and the new wood during the summertime that leads up to the regathering or the harvest festivals. And those are things that have already happened as well, but that's for a different time. So without further ado, this is on Sukkot or the 15th of the seventh month, our first reference here is Waikra or Leviticus 23, verses 33 through 44. It says, And Yahuwah spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of this seventh month is the festival of booth, booths sorry, for seven days to Yahuwah. On the first day is a set-apart gathering. You do no servile work. For seven days you bring an offering made by fire to Yahuwah. On the eighth day there shall be a set-apart gathering for you, and you shall bring an offering made by fire to Yahuwah. It is a closing festival. You do no servile work. These are the appointed times of Yahuwah which you proclaim as set-apart gatherings, to bring an offering made by fire to Yahuwah, a burnt offering and a grain offering, a slaughtering and a drink, or, and drink offerings as commanded for every day, besides the Sabbaths of Yahuwah, and besides your gifts, and besides all your vows, and besides all your voluntary offerings which you give to Yahuwah. On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you gather in the fruit of the land, observe the festival of Yahuwah for seven days. On the first day is a rest, and on the eighth day a rest, and you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruits of good trees, branches of palm trees, twigs of leafy trees, and willows of the stream, and shall rejoice before Yahuwah your Elohim for seven days, and you shall observe it as a festival to Yahuwah for seven days in the year, a law forever in your generations. Observe it in the seventh month, dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native Yisraeli dwell in booths, so that your generations know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I went or when I brought them out of the land of Mitzrayim. I am Yahuwah your Elohim. And Yahuwah or sorry, and thus did Moshe speak of the appointed times of Yahuwah to the children of Israel. And that last one was just wrapping up what's at the end of the chapter, culminating in all of the festival days. There are the appointed times of Yahuwah. Specifically, it mentions Sabbaths, the plural, because we have the weekly Shabbat, which is perpetual and, and forever. And then we have all the Sabbaths on the festival days that are also meant to be kept. So something that, for, that we should be 
seriously considering if we're not. At least look into it, right? But here's the first reference of, of the keeping of the Feast of Tabernacles or booths, if you will. Sukkah, right? Or Sukkot in the book of Yobelim and how that came about. This is from chapter 16 and it's subtitled, The Messenger Appear Unto Abraham. And on the new month of the fourth month, we appeared unto Abraham. A lot of people have conjectures and things that they say about who this we is. But if you look at the beginning and the end of the book of Yobelim, the messenger of the presence, who is told by the father to speak to Moshe and write down this book and dictate to him, that's the one who's saying that he did this through his mouth, that he said this stuff through him, and that he's the one that appeared and did things that when you look in Scripture, what we call the Bible, it just says that that's Yahuwah speaking and coming and doing things. And they generally knew that it was the Melech or the messenger who came in the name of Yahuwah, the one in whom his name is in him, and he would by no means leave them unpunished for their inequity. Exactly what is mentioned in Deborim, Deuteronomy, and you can see that in the book of Judges, right, with chapter 2. That is our Mashiach, and he's the one that where it says we, that's the Father speaking through the Son, right? He's doing his works through him. And you see evidence of it even in the common scriptures where it says, let us go down, let us make man after their image, right? But either way, it says, and we talked with him and we announced to him that a son would be given to him by Sarah, his wife. And Sarah laughed for she heard that we had spoken these words with Abraham and we admonished her. And she became afraid and denied that she had or laughed on account of the words. And we told her the name of her son, as, as his name is ordained and written in the Shamayim tablets, i.e. Yitzach. And that when we returned to her at a set time, or at an appointed time, she would have conceived a son. And in this month, that was on the first of the fourth month, right? This is when he appeared to him and he was telling him that he would be promising him the son. It says, and in this month, Yahuwah executed his judgments on Sodom and Gomorrah and Zeboim and all the region of the Yarden. And he burned them with fire and brimstone and destroyed them unto, until this day, even as I have declared unto you all their works, that they are wicked and sinners exceedingly, and that they defile themselves and commit fornication in their flesh and work uncleanness on the earth. And in like manner, Yahuwah will execute judgment on the places where they have done according to the uncleanness of the Sodomites, like unto the judgment of Sodom. But Lot we saved, for Yahuwah remembered Abraham and sent him out from the midst of the overthrow. And he and his daughters committed sin upon the earth, such as had not been on the earth since the days of Adam till his time. For the man lay with his daughters. And behold, it was commanded and engraved concerning all his seed on the Shamayim tablets to remove them and root them out and to execute judgment upon them like the judgment of Sodom and to leave no seed of the man on the earth on the day of condemnation. Now, that's the seed of the man. It doesn't talk about the women, unlike in the uh, children of the Canaanites that were all put under the ban. But for the women of the Moabites, there was no such injunction. And that's actually talked about specifically in the book of Gad the seer, where a Moabite shepherd for Dawid goes to him and says, let me be circumcised and join your people. And he says, you can't. The Moabites can never join us. And he bewailed the condition. He says, but your own grandmother's a Moabite. And he says, ah, that you've confounded me. Now I have to go inquire of Yahuwah. And then he asks him, you know, what's going on there? And he informs him that his grandmother was a, a woman, 
uh, not of the seed of Lot, but of the daughters, and they all belong to him. Now, that's also context for some of the things that you can read in Scripture that isn't explicitly stated in that capacity. That's also part of the reason why the, the line of Dawid can be carried down through the daughters as well. It says, And in this month Abraham moved from Hebron and departed and dwelt between Kadesh and Shor in the mountains of Gerar. And in the middle of the fifth month he moved from there and dwelt at the well of the oath, or Beersheba. And in the middle of the sixth month, the fifteenth of the sixth month, right? Yahuwah visited Sarah and did unto her as he had spoken, and she conceived. And she bare a son in the third month. And in the middle of the month, at the time of which Yahuwah had spoken to Abraham, on the festival of the first fruits of the harvest, Yitzhak was born. The same as the renewed covenant, promised seed, born again believers, all the covenants, everything was born on the 15th of the third month there, as well as Yahuda. After this is a type and shadow of the, the one coming as the king. So the promised seed and the king both born on that day, as well as every covenant. And Ab willing, you can see the picture right here. And Abraham circumcised his son on the eighth day. He was the first that was circumcised according to the covenant which is ordained forever. And in the sixth year of the fourth week, now remember these words in Hebrew, the word forever is traditionally olam. I don't know of any other words that it, actually they translate as forever. There's length of days in Hebrew, which is the... Uh, just literally long or lengthening days. And then there's olam, which they translate as forever, but it literally means age. Olam wa'ed, they say forever and ever, but it's literally unto ages and witnessed, or and testified to, if you will. Right here it says, And in the sixth year of the fourth week, we came to Abraham, to the well of the oath, or Beersheba, and we appeared unto him, as we had told Sarah that we should return to her, and she would have conceived a son. And we returned in the seventh month and found Sarah with child before us. And we barak him, and we announced to him all the things which he or which had been decreed concerning him, that he should not die till he should begat six more sons, or six sons more, and should see sorry, and should see them before he died, but that in Yitzhak should his name and seed be called, and that all the seed of his sons should be Gentiles and be reckoned with the Gentiles, but from the sons of Yitzhak one should become a set-apart seed and should not be reckoned among the Gentiles. For he should become the portion of the Most High, and all his seed had fallen into the possession of Yahuwah, that it should be unto Yahuwah for a people, for his possession above all nations, and that it should become a kingdom and Kohanim, so a kingdom and priests, and a set-apart nation. Reminiscent of what it mentions in the book of Revelation for the millennial reign, that it's during the thousand-year reign that were made kings and Kohanim, kings and priests with him, if you will, right? And we went our way, and we announced to Sarah all that we had told him, and they both rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And that's the point. And he built there an altar to Yahuwah who had delivered him and who was making him rejoice in the land of his sojourning, all right, this is rejoicing not at what he has now, but at the future expectation of what these things will be because he was shown the truth, right? And that he's literally rejoicing that he has his son here. All of these things culminate, and you're going to see it again here in a little bit. But the idea of revelation of the truth fully culminating, the, the promised seed being delivered, and then the rejoicing and keeping it. 
that is both tied to this er this time. So revelation and rejoicing in the kept promises with him, temporarily dwelling with him. And he built there an altar to Yahuwah who had delivered him and who was making him rejoice in the land of his sojourning. And he celebrated a festival of joy in this month, seven days, near the altar which he had built at Beersheba, or the well of the oath. And he built booths for himself and for his servants on this festival. And he was the first to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles on the earth. And during these seven days, he brought each day to the altar a burnt offering to Yahuwah, two oxen, two rams, seven sheep, one he-goat for a sin offering, that he might atone thereby for himself and for his seed. And as a thanksgiving offering, or a thank offering, seven rams, seven kids, seven sheep, and seven he-goats, and the fruit offerings and their drink offerings, and he burnt all the fat thereof on the altar, a chosen offering unto Yahuwah for a sweet-smelling savor. And morning and evening he burnt fragrant substances, frankincense and galbanum, and stactite and nard and myrrh, and spice and costum. All these seven he offered crushed, mixed together in equal parts pure. And remember, the, the offering of the incense is like the prayer of the Kodeshim. In it's established in the New Covenant for anyone that isn't aware in what's called the Apostolic Constitutions. We're enjoined to fellowship morning and evening daily with your local fellowship to sing psalms and, and pray, right? To ex exhort each other with the word and also amongst the believers that are immersed in walking right, you would have your final fellowship where you pray for being kept free from sin, keeping the world, and doing other things where you know that your prayers will be heard. So there, there's a whole there's a whole constitution for how his kingdom's supposed to function. It's literally in that book. And if you're doing it sincerely, it's reminiscent of doing the very things that are established all the way from the beginning. You can see Abraham offering morning and evening <clears throat> excuse me, these things that smell good as like the offerings of the prayers. That was first instituted with Adam after he was kicked out of the garden or after his sin, it mentions in the book of Yobelim earlier. But we'll go ahead and continue here. And he celebrated this feast during seven days, rejoicing with all his heart and with all his soul. Remember, if you don't remember, we just shared a little bit on the uh, Why to Fast. It was a writing, I think that was from Tertullian, but it might have been on from someone else. He explicitly mentions that as when you feast, you're rejoicing, and it's when you're sated in full that you can rejoice. So when you are afflicting your soul, you do so with abstaining from food. All right, he made it very clear and an easy way to see that. Here's another witness to that while he was feasting and rejoicing with all of his heart and with all of his soul. He and all those who were in his house, and there was no stranger with him, nor any that was uncircumcised. And he Barak his creator, who had created him in his generation. For he had created him according to his good pleasure. For he knew and perceived that from him would arise the plant of righteousness for the eternal generations. So he knew that from him would come our Mashiach, the plant of righteousness, right? The one who he saw in the stars that, like our brother was mentioning earlier, he knew that his son would be resurrected because he knew the advent of our Mashiach. It says very clearly, I believe in, I believe it's in the recognitions of Clement, not the homilies, but Kepha explains very clearly that because he was an astrologer, because he knew the stars, unlike other men of that time, though, he was able to recognize the creator through them. And anyone who's taken the time to look into the topic, the witness in the stars is one by E.W. Bollinger. 
There's another book called The Maserot by Francis Rosalind. The, the literal constellations, the names of the stars and the deacons all point to the, the Besorah, the message of the good news, his redeeming and what he came to do. And he ties this stuff into the sun, moon, and stars being like the bridegroom, his taught ones, and the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of heaven and his taught ones, if you will, to point out that these things are true. The lights above, for example, the stars know him who names them and shows forth him who numbers them. They're all called by name. He knows the course of every one of them. These are all written in different places, but then you can see it manifest in creation with his people. The ones that are shining as lights in the world are the ones that truly know who he is, and they're walking according to the dictates of his conscience, what he willed them to do. But he says, For he knew and perceived that from him... Yitzhak would arise the plant of righteousness for the eternal generations and from him a set apart seed so that it should become like him who made all things. The one who's made like in his image and likeness, right? And he barak and rejoiced. So he blessed and rejoiced and he called the name of the festival, the festival of Yahuwah, a joy acceptable to the most high Yahuwah. And we, Barak, or blessed him forever and all his seed after him throughout all the generations of the earth because he celebrated this festival in its season according to the testimony of the heavenly tablets or the Shamayim tablets. That's a theme that you find throughout the book of what's called Jubilees or Yobelim, where literally everything that will ever be is already written, established by the Father in the, the heavenly tablets or the Shamayim tablets, everything is recorded. So anyone can look at that and see that it was already written and ordained. You'll see later on that some of those tablets were brought down in regard to all that would happen to um, Yaakov and his children forever. And he was able to read them and retain that information and then write it down to pass on to his children. So, uh, a hand in a glove, hand in a glove thing. As he sees, so he does, and as he does, so he enjoins for others to do. <clears throat> but here we go. It says, For this reason it is ordained on the Shamayim, or heavenly tablets, concerning Yisrael, that they shall celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles seven days with joy, in the seventh month acceptable before Yahuwah, a statute forever throughout their generations every year. And it, so for all ages, right? It doesn't literally mean forever, but for all ages. This is not to be done away with for ages. And in just a moment, you'll see that even under the millennial reign or that age, this festival will be kept. The fact that it's not being kept by a vast majority of people now, that it was taken away, all of these things were foretold. He literally said it would happen, and then it did happen because his word is true. It's it's reality, as we've been sharing, as you all, you know, you're all are becoming very, very familiar with. He says, and there and to this there is no limit of days, for it is ordained unto ages regarding Yisrael, that they should celebrate it and dwell in booths and set wreaths upon their heads and take leafy bows and willows from the brook. And Abraham took branches of palm trees and the fruit of goodly trees and every day going round the altar with the branches seven times in the morning. He praised and gave thanks to Yahuwah his Elohim for all things in joy. And that's something that we can all do going around our tabernacles, at least, because we don't have an altar. We're not supposed to be doing, sacrificing animals anymore, but you can do that. The next reference here is the illusion of the millennial reign foreshadowed in the kahuna being given to Louis. Another type of this, when 
you see the the fullness of it being given to all the children like it was supposed to be with the renewed covenant was after he took them out of egypt and he brought them to mount sinai but then they broke the covenant and it was given to louis his descendants at that time as another type of this but um that was all known and foreordained because it was the levitical kahuna until the advent of our Mashiach, in which the Melchizedek now takes precedence, the one that is not of this world, if you will, in a tabernacle not made with man's hands. But right here it says, Louis is made a Kohen to the Most High Yahuwah. This is chapter 32. And he abode that night at Bethel, and Louis dreamed that they had ordained and made him the Kohen of the Most High Yahuwah, him and his sons forever. And he woke from his sleep and Barak Yahuwah. This would have been the second vision or the second dream that he had the, where they actually bestowed upon him all the different garments and whatnot. The first one that he had, he was taken up into the Shamayim and spoke to the father and the son in vision there and was given that. Afterwards, he was it was foretold by Yitzhak himself and, and you'll see right here. Then he had this dream. And it says, And Yaakov rose early in the morning on the 14th of this month, and he gave a tithe of all that came with him, both of men and cattle, both of gold and every vessel and garment. Yes, he gave tithes of all. And in those days, Rachel or Rachel became pregnant with her son Benjamin. And Jacob counted his sons from him upwards, and Louis fell to the portion of Yahuwah. And his father clothed him in the garments of the kahuna and filled his hands. And on the fifteenth of this month, he brought to the altar fourteen oxen amongst the cattle, and twenty-eight rams, and forty-nine sheep, and seven lambs, and twenty-one kids of the goats as a burnt offering on the altar of sacrifice, well-pleasing for a sweet savor before Yahuwah. And uh, Brother Earl was the first one I know of that pointed this out to me that I can recall. I may have heard of it before, but it never really took it to heart. Kids, right here, is the English word for baby goat. And it literally comes from the Hebrew gid, gidi. The gidi is a baby goat. We just had the G become a ki, and we drop that kitty all the time. But you say kids or a kid for a goat even today. When that became the usage of speaking of our children, I'm not entirely certain, but I do believe it was more of a modern phenomenon, and it has it's indicative to the conditions that we're living through. But that's kind of a thing for a separate time, and it's one of the reasons why I, I don't use that word for my children anymore. He says, this was his offering in consequence of the vow which he had vowed that he would give a tenth with the first fruits offering or offerings and their drink offerings. And when the fire had consumed it, he burnt incense on the fire over the fire and for a thank offering two oxen and four rams and four sheep, four he goats and two sheep of a year old and two kids of the goats, and thus he did daily for seven days. And he and all his sons and his men were eating with joy there during the seven days, and barocking or blessing, and thanking Yahuwah, who had delivered him out of all his tribulation, and they, or and had given him his vow. And remember, the name Yahuwah means he who causes it to be. He who causes it to exist, or he who makes it present tense, if you will. So he's the one who did all these things by the very meaning of his name. And he tithed all the clean animals and made a burnt sacrifice. Sorry. And made a burnt sacrifice, but the unclean animals he gave to Louis, or to Levi, his son. And he gave him all the souls or inner beings of the men. 
And Louis discharged the Kohen office, the, the priestly office at Bethel before Jacob, his father, in preference to his ten brothers. Jacob is Jacob. Sorry about that. And he was a Kohen or priest there, and Jacob gave him or gave his vow. Thus he tithed again the tithe to Yahuwah and set it apart, and it became set apart to, unto him. And for this reason it is ordained on the heavenly tablets as a Torah for the tithing again, the tithe to eat before Yahuwah from year to year, in the place where it is chosen that his name should dwell. And to this Torah there is no limit of days unto ages. This ordinance is written that it may be fulfilled from year to year in eating the second tithe before Yahuwah in the place where it has been chosen and nothing shall remain over from it from this year to the year following. Now see, the place where he was chosen was originally his Hekel, and after the advent of our Mashiach, it is not just the Hekel, but it's in every place where he, his assemblies had been established. They're like little arcs, if you will, carrying the people that are in them through this time until he returns. That's an illusion or parable given by Kepha as well. It might be in the Apostolic Constitutions, but I know that it is in the Recognitions of Clement. Verse 12, it says, For in its year shall the seed be eaten till the days of the gathering of the seed of the year, and the wine till the days of the wine, and the oil till the days of its season. And all that is left thereof and becomes old, let it be regarded as polluted. Let it be burnt with fire, for it is unclean. And this is of the offerings that are brought in. They use it or lose it. It's not supposed to be kept and hoarded. And thus let them eat it together in the sanctuary, and let them not suffer it to become old. And all the tithes of the oxen and sheep shall be set apart unto Yahuwah, and shall belong to his Kohanim, or priests, which they will eat before him from year to year. For thus it is ordained and engraved regarding the tithe on the Shamayim tablets. And if you remember, we'll go into the tithes more in detail some other time too, but every third year they were supposed to keep it, and then give to the poor orphan, the sons of Louis, in the town that they lived in, to rejoice with them there, and to have the, the enjoyments there, not to bring that tithe to the Hekel. This is, On the following night, on the 22nd day of this month, Jacob, or Jacob, resolved to build that place and to surround the court with a wall. And this would be Beth El, the place where he first saw the vision of, the, of Yahuwah at the top of the ladder with the messengers ascending and descending upon him. He says, He resolved to build that place and to make, or and to surround the court with a wall and to set it apart and make it set apart unto ages for himself and his children after him. And Yahuwah appeared to him by night, and Baruch, or blessed him, and said to him, Your name shall not be called Yaakob, but Yisrael shall they name your name. And he said to him again, I am Yahuwah who created the Shamayim and the earth, and I will increase you and multiply you exceedingly. And kings shall come forth from you, and they shall judge everywhere, wherever the foot of the sons of men has trodden. And I will give to your seed all the earth which is under the Shamayim, and they shall judge all the nations according to their desires. And after that they shall get possession of the whole earth, and inherit it forever. And he finished speaking with him. And he went up from him, and Yaakob looked till he had ascended into Shamayim. 
says, no one has gone up or come down except the son of Adam. Every time you see in, in any of these visions where they're watching one and he ascends up like that, whether of his own self or in the fire, that's usually a telltale sign of it being Yahushua, because he's the only one that does that, as he said. And when he's looking up till he ascended is reminiscent of what his disciples or taught ones did after his resurrection. And he saw in a vision of the night, and behold, a messenger descended from the Shamayim with seven tablets in his hands, and he gave them to Yaakov, and he read them and knew all that was written therein, which would befall him and his sons throughout all the ages. And he showed him all that was written on the tablets and said to him, do not build this place and do not make it an eternal sanctuary and do not dwell here for this is not the place go to that house of or go to the house of Abraham your father and dwell with Yitzhak your father until the day of the death of your father for in Mitzrayim you shall die in Shalom and in this land you shall be buried with honor in the sepulcher of your fathers with Abraham and Yitzhak. Fear not, for as you have seen and read it, thus shall it all be. And do you write down everything as you have seen and read. And Yaakov said, Yahuwah, how can I remember all that I have read and seen? And he said to him, I will bring all things to your remembrance, which is what our Mashiach mentions to his taught ones as well. And he went up from him, and he awoke from his sleep, and he remembered everything which he had read and seen. And he wrote down all the words which he had read and seen. And he celebrated there yet another day. And he sacrificed thereon according to all that he had sacrificed on the former days, and called its name addition, for this day was added, and the former days he called the feast. And thus it was manifested that it should be, and it is written on the Shamayim tablets, wherefore it was revealed to him that he should celebrate it and add it to the seven days of the feast. Now here's an example of the law that is forever changing according to as he wills it in time because he wills it. You'll see this phenomenon happening more than once, including with the circumcision, including with the dietary laws. The point is that we are to do what he said as he says and not go beyond it, right? So when he gave them all things to eat, they had all things. When he gave the children clean and unclean distinctions, that's it. And if he hasn't changed it, then he hasn't changed it. When he had all men one way and then he told Abraham to circumcise himself and then he foretells that he's doing away with it and then at the time of the renewed covenant he told them if you do that it's not going to be well and he's pointing to things that had already happened as a foreshadow of the future in like Yahushua the son of Nun bringing in the children in the wilderness that had not been circumcised while all the ones that had been circumcised were cut off right foretelling by Ezra that it would be. I'm just trying to give examples because that one in particular is a contentious point for people about circumcision. But it follows this very pattern where, or like with marriage, where he establishes marriage in the beginning, a man and a woman. In time, he allows divorce for a time because it's allowing, it's showing the conditions of the truth that we're living through. And when our Mashiach came, divorce except for the on the account of adultery or idolatry is not permitted and if you put away your wife you cannot marry another while she's still alive or vice versa with the husband this is after he's come now that's how that's established it has changed over time just like you can see the feast day being changed over time First, the offerings given, and now another day's added. And you'll see here in a moment, there's different offerings given when the children are keeping it in the land. And again, 
when we come into the renewed covenant times, it's not going to be exactly the same. During the millennial reign, it'll be a little different. But it's still going to be according to what he said. And the fact that we're keeping it never changes. So I'll be willing that that makes more sense. This is, and its name was called addition because it was recorded amongst the days of the feast according to the number of the days of the year. And in the night on the 23rd of this month, Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died. And they buried her beneath the city under the oak of the river. And he called the name of this place the river of Deborah and the oak, the oak of the morning of Deborah. And Ribka or Rebekah, went and returned to her house to his father Yitzhak. And Jacob or Jake, Jacob sent by her hand rams and sheep and he goats that she should prepare a meal for his father such as he desired. And he went after his mother till he came to the land of Cabratan, and he dwelt there. And Rachel, and Rachel, Rachel, bare a son in the night and called his name son of my sorrow, which is Benoni, for she suffered in giving him birth. And if you remember, she had also stolen the household idols of her father, lied and, and had other things. This is after they repented of it. They washed their garments and turned away from that. And now we have to deal with the consequences of the, those things. But she's dying in childbirth, which is what's foretold or mentioned by Shaul that will save a woman. So you can see the picture with what's going on there. But his father called his name Benjamin, or son of my right hand, or son of my old age, on the eleventh of the eighth month, in the first of the sixth week of this Yobel, or 2,143 years from creation. And Rachel, or Rachel, died there, and she was buried in the land of Ephrath, the same as Bethlehem, or the house of bread. And Jacob, Jacob, built a pillar on the grave of Rachel or Rachel on the road above her grave. All right, and then the next few ones are just references for what it mentions within Scripture about what we should do. I'm not going to read the one through the book of Numbers all the way, but I'll show it to you when we get to it. This is from Deuteronomy 16, okay, verses 13 through 17. It says, perform the festival of Sukkot for seven days after the ingathering from the, your threshing floor and from your wine press. And you shall rejoice in your festival, you and your son and your daughter and your male servant and your female servant and the Luiim and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates. And this is how it's applicable for us, because I did not share the example here, but for anyone that wants to, you can look at the book, the apocryphal writing called Tobit or Toby Yahu, and he shows you how you can keep a festival even in Nineveh. So he was keeping the feast outside of the land, and it doesn't mean that you're offering sacrifices, but he rejoiced in his heart, even when he had sorrow, he invited the poor to feast with him, and he was doing the things to the best of his ability here. It says, For seven days you shall celebrate to Yahuwah your Elohim in the place which Yahuwah chooses, because Yahuwah your Elohim does bless you in all your increase and in all the work of your hands. And you shall be only rejoicing. That's Ak Sameach, right? Only rejoice. Three times a year all your males appear before Yahuwah your Elohim in the place which he chooses at the festival of Matzot, or unleavened bread, and at the festival of Shavuot, and at the festival of Sukkot. And none should appear before Yahuwah empty-handed, but each one with his gift in his hand, or of his hand, according to the Baraka, or blessing of Yahuwah, your Elohim, which he has given to you. All right, and then this one I'll scroll through. You're more than welcome to pause it, to look and read it as you want to. 
we're going to read for the first day and then i'll just point out the difference between every day here but this is chapter 29 of the book of numbers it says and on the 15th day of the seventh month you have a set apart gathering you do no servile work and you shall celebrate a festival to yahuwah seven days and you shall bring near an offering, an ascending offering, an offering made by fire, a sweet fragrance to Yahuwah, 13 young bulls, 2 rams, 14 lambs a year old. Perfect ones they are, and their grain offerings, fine flour mixed with oil, 3 tenths of an ephah for each of the 13 bulls, 2 tenths for each of the 2 rams, and one-tenth for each of the fourteen lambs, and one male goat as a sin offering, besides the continual ascending offering, the morning and evening, right? It's grain offering and it's drink offering. So that was on the first day, and then you can see thirteen young bulls. On the second day, there's twelve young bulls. On the third day, eleven. On the fourth day, ten. On the fifth day, nine. Sixth day, eight. Seventh day, seven. And then the eighth day is its own offerings. But those are an descending order for those. Different than the offerings offered by Abraham and by Jacob in their seasons. They all might represent things in a parable type form. But that's something for a different time, and we'd have to look to see whether or not they're accurate and their numbers and what it might represent. As far as I know, the only thing that I I know of as a fact that the offerings are alluding to are the martyrs. The dedication of the Hekel, or the, the temple, as we'll see, there was tons of offerings made. And when he came and brought the kingdom of heaven, there was martyrs instituted at the founding of that building without hands, if you will, all the way through until he returns. Maybe not overtly, but everyone perfected will be like their master. And if he's preaching his death until he comes, that's the facts that we're going to be living in, right? But um, I will leave you to read those ones on your own for the rest of that one because it is rather long. The next reference here is Deuteronomy or Debarim chapter 31. And it sorry, and it says, And Moshe commanded them, saying, At the end of seven years, at the appointed time, the year of release at the festival of Sukkot, when all Yisrael comes to appear before Yahuwah, your Elohim, in the place which he chooses, read this Torah before all Yisrael in their hearing. So here's another rehearsal of that. It wasn't every single time, but every seven years, because generally the people didn't have books. They didn't have the Torah themselves. So every seven years at this time, they would gather and hear the entire thing to help them keep it in their minds. Assemble the people, the men and the women and the little ones and your sojourner who is within your gates so that they hear and so that they learn to fear Yahuwah your Elohim, and to guard to do all the words of this Torah. And their children, who have not known it, should hear and learn to fear Yahuwah your Elohim, as long as you live in the land you are passing over the Yarden to possess. All right, and then this next section, I only took part of chapter 8, two sections of it because it does have a very long prayer i encourage you to get the context for all of these sections on your own to get the fullness of it and you can see how it all plays out but right here this is the foreshadowing of the millennial reign with the tabernacling with elohim being represented okay then Shalomo assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief fathers of the children of Israel, to King Shalomo in Yerushalayim to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of Yahuwah from the city of Dawid, which is Yon. And all the men of Israel assembled to King Shalomo at the festival, 
in the month of Ethnaim, which is the seventh month. And all the elders of Yisrael came, and the Kohanim took up the ark, and brought up the ark of Yahuwah, and the tent of appointment, and all the set-apart utensils that were in the tent. And the Kohanim and the Luiim brought them up, and King Shalomo and all the congregation of Yisrael, who had assembled with him, were with him before the ark, slaughtering so many sheep and cattle that they could not be counted or numbered. And then it breaks off to verse 65 here. And Shalomo at that time performed the festival in all Yisrael with him, a great assembly from the entrance of Hamath to the wadi of Mitzrayim. So from the entrance of Hamath to the, the Nile Delta, the beginnings of the Nile Delta, if you will. Before Yahuwah our Elohim, seven days and seven days, fourteen days. On the eighth day, he sent the people away, and they became, or and they baruch or blessed the king, and went to their tents rejoicing and glad of heart for all the goodness that Yahuwah had done for his servant Dawid and for Yisrael his people. And then you can see the other illusion I was mentioning to you, the foreshadowing of this being done after the return from Babylon, what we would call after the times of the Reformation. And on the second day, the heads of the fathers' houses of all the people with the Kohanim and Luiim were gathered to Ezra, the scribe, in order to study the words of the Torah. And they found written in the book, which Yahuwah had commanded by Moshe, that the children of Yisrael should dwell in booths in the festival of the seventh month. Sorry, it says new month there. It should just say month. And just for perfect clarity, the word month doesn't exist in Hebrew in itself. The word there would be seventh renewal, if you wanted to be accurate in the translation meaning. But we don't generally call them renewals at all. We call them months because that's the, the word that we know in English for them. That's the only reason why I put that there. It's for the sake of comprehension. Excuse me. But in reality, the way the Hebrew works, the months were established, the foundation was laid down at the beginning, and these are all renewals of that first, the first one. So it's just renewed every single time it comes again. It's not something new, and it's not necessarily a month, because month has to do with moon, the numberings of a moon. That's the etymology of the word itself. It's nothing to do with um, how we use it today, or at least in this context here. But back on point. It says, And they found written in the Torah, which Yahuwah had commanded by Moshe, that the children of Yisrael should dwell in booths in the festival of the seventh month, and that they should announce and proclaim in all their cities and in Yerushalayim, saying, Go out to the mountain and bring olive branches, branches of oil, oil trees and myrtle branches and palm branches, and branches of leafy trees to make booths. We call leafy trees evergreens, right? To make booths as it is written. So the people went out and brought them and made themselves booths, each one on the roof of his house and in their courtyards and in the courtyards of the house of Elohim and in the open space of the water gate and in the open space of the gate of Ephraim. Water gate, Ephraim. There, there's a lot of parable prophetic things that you can see here, but we're, it's not for the point for today. This is, or at least that's not the main point, but I'm trying to, to show you this is what it's alluding to here. And the entire assembly of those who had come back from the captivity made booths and sat under the booths for since the days of Yahushua, the son of Nun, until that day the children of Israel had not done so, and there was very great rejoicing. 
Now, in this version, in, in most versions, you can see Nehemiah does not say Yahushua, the son of Nun. It actually says Yeshua. And that's one of the evidences of his name being removed, and they're adding something that is not the truth. The reason why that was done and all of that we can get into for another time, but I wanted to point out it usually will say Yeshua there, and that is an error that was brought back after the Babylonian captivity as a type of things that would come. It says, And day by day, from the first day until the last day, he read from the book of the Torah of Elohim. And they performed the festival seven days, and on the eighth day there was an assembly according to the right ruling. Just for clarity's sake, if we are correct in it being the 80th Yobel that he announced the year of Yahuwah Melchizedek's favor, then that would make this year 5,910 from creation, which is not the seventh year that you should be doing that. It's the, the second year in now, I believe, or something to that effect. But we'll, we'll double check and know for sure next uh, going into this so everyone can do that if it's something that you're wanting to try to be in line with. But this is from fourth as or sorry, from Ezra from the common scriptures, chapter three, verses four and five. And it says, And they performed the festival of Sukkot as it is written and the daily ascending offerings by number according to the right ruling for each day, and afterward the continual ascending offering, and those for the new month, and for all the appointed times of Yahuwah that were set apart, also for everyone who volunteered a voluntary offering to Yahuwah. And that's just another witness to Nehemiah that they were reestablishing things at that time, after the Babylonian captivity. And then here's the last reference I believe we have for, for now. This is the section that foretells the future and that we will still be keeping this time. This is from Zechariahu or Zechariah, chapter 14, 16 through 19. And it shall be that all who are left from all the nations which came up against Yerushalayim shall go up from year to year and bow themselves to the king, Yahuwah of hosts, and to celebrate the festival of Sukkot. And it shall be that if any one of the clans or families of the earth does not come up to Yerushalayim to bow himself to the king, Yahuwah of hosts, on them there is to be no rain. And if the family of Mitzrayim does not come up and enter in, then there is no rain. On them is the plague with which Yahuwah plagues the nations who do not come up to celebrate the festival of Sukkot. This is the punishment of Mitzrayim and the punishment of all the nations who do not come up to celebrate the festival of Sukkot. Because during that time, it will be living it out. It will be during the millennial reign where we're doing our temporary dwellings with him. It's the beginning of the consummation of the times, but it's not our forever after. This is explained in detail in 4th Ezra and in 2nd Baruch and in other places where it goes into it. We'll be having the fire at night and the cloud during the day over every one of those that are his. They have manna throughout the millennial reign during those times. And while every one of the first resurrection will be made like the messengers, you're still going to have those that are mortal who will be living upwards to a thousand years if they're righteous or in their disposition, but they still can die. They can still grow older. They still have frailty because they were like the Canaanites in the land that after Yahushua, the son of Nun, brought the children in, they made the covenant with them and became their, their servants. Right, So there's types and pictures of these things to teach us. Ob willing, that was edifying. And um, if you can think of any other references for the festival of Sukkot, where it's mentioned in scripture that they kept it, what it might point out to, or foretellings in regard to the future of it, please don't hesitate to share. 
Otherwise, you all, thank you for your time. You have a wonderful celebration today of building your sukkah and um, rejoicing before your maker. Thank you. And we will see you next time.